Welcome to Around the Writer's Table, a podcast focusing on the crossroads of creativity, craft, and conscious living for writers of all ages and backgrounds. Your hosts are Gina, Melody, and Kim Boo, three close friends and women of a certain age who bring to the table their eclectic backgrounds and unique perspectives on the trials, tribulations, and the joys of writing. So pull up a chair and get comfortable here around the writer's table. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Around the Writer's Table. And we're so glad to join you. We're kicking off a whole new thing, and I'm really excited about it. Gina has given me and Melody a little bit of a sneak peek at it, and it's going to be so helpful for authors, not just beginning authors. I know the last couple episodes where we talked about editing, if you want those episodes, they're great. Go back and listen to them. Uh, But those were very newbie oriented, I think, in a lot of ways. But at this point, when we're moving into talking about a creativity cycle, and Gina's going to go into a lot of detail on that, I'll let you wait in suspense. But Mm -hmm. this will be helpful for authors at all levels and at all stages of your writing career. So thanks for joining us on this journey. My name is Kim New York. I'm a romance novelist and former project manager who helps writers and solopreneurs find time, mojo, and motivation to create, including myself, which is my journey right now. I've also got my co-host, Melody A. Scout. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, my friend? Thanks, Kimboo. Welcome, listeners. My name is Melody A. Scout, and I help my clients find their sense of home by restoring balance and harmony to their lives through plant spirit medicine in my book, Soul of the Seasons. Hi, everybody. This is Gina. I'm glad to be with you, too. It's, um, I'm excited about our topic today. Um, I am passionate about helping women, particularly women writers, find their voice through writing, understand what they're thinking, understand what their values are, understand what they want to share with the world in terms of words on the page. And we've got so much to cover in this episode, so I'm not going to spend too long on the introduction more than we've already done. So Gina, tell us about the creativity cycle. That's what we're going to be doing an overview this episode, right? So let's just jump into that. What, what are we going? What are we doing? What can you tell us? So what I'd like to do today is just give you sort of a brief overview of what I call the 10 stages of creativity. Now, um, for you listeners, this is something that I've come up with after a couple of decades of working with women writers at all uh, levels of experience um, in in all stages of their own writing journey. This uh, cycle uh, includes 10 stages, as I mentioned, and I'm just going to briefly go over what each stage entails. And ladies, I want to hear from each of you as I go through these. But first, I want to touch on a couple of aspects of this cycle. It is a cycle for a number of reasons. We don't experience our creative journey in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. (laughs) There are certain stages of the cycle that we might get hung up in. There are certain stages of the cycle that we might do what I call looping. We will loop back through sometimes multiple times before we have what we need or experience what we need or think what we need to think in order to move to the next stage. But there is a reason beyond the fact that it is um, not a linear process that I call this a cycle. Definitely want you women to chime in on this because I know you have some perspectives about how important the cycle is and how many different ways we experience cycles in our lives. You know, obviously, as women, we have a cycle. Um, There are so many other things in our lives that we experience as cycles. And we were just talking a few minutes ago about how life is cycles and seasons everything goes through this process so I know we're fond our little brains are fond of thinking in linear fashion or if a then b but uh I rarely if ever find that is the path my journey takes me on whether it's 
interpersonal or writing or creativity. And I'd just like to add, you know, Melody, you don't talk about it a lot, but you are also a landscape designer. You work with plants and you work with your clients on creating, you know, environments for plants. So this, I, I'm sure that that feeds into a little bit of how you see cycles because I don't do plants at all, man. Like I don't, I don't, <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm the black thumb of the family. Right. So uh, I was just thinking of that while you were talking about it. Cause it's not just as women as people, it, like the cycles are all around us. Absolutely. And that's why I wrote my book because a con- connection between the natural world and, you know, as a gardener and a landscaper is makes it so obvious. I get so many of my interpersonal um, interior lessons from the natural world. So that is a great way to observe the seasons and cycles of life. And, you know, just guess what, when you observe nature, you don't find nature kicking and screaming the whole way, because now it's moving from spring into the heat of summer. It's like, nope, we're going to adapt. We're going to get ready for it. We're going to do what it needs. We need to do to get through the next season and to flourish. I love the fact too, that, you know, here we are in, in the season of spring and that we're launching off onto this new um, perspective of looking at the stages of the creativity uh, cycle. So let's um, I'm going to summarize. There are 10 stages and Each one, um, I've come up with a particular name for it, and I'm going to I'm going to avoid my temptation to talk deeply about each one as I get into it because there are several (laughs) of these that really resonate with me. And so, as I describe these ladies, I've got I'm going to have some questions for you afterwards about which ones may resonate with you. So, And I'd just like to break in really quick to let listeners know if you go to our website, there is a handout so that, you know, don't feel like you have to write down each one as she's saying them. We've got a handout. You can either go download that at now to follow Mm -hmm. along while she's describing these, or you can do it afterwards. Like we're not going to be, there's not going to be a pop quiz at the end of this, but uh, (laughs) just, uh, it's going to be a lot of information. So I just wanted our listeners to know that we're going to have resources to help them keep track of it all. Yeah. Thank you, Kim Boo. And also the reason we're doing this overview is because in our future episodes, we are going to be taking each one, one by one, and doing a deep dive into each stage. And so that's why we're just sort of doing this overview now to give you an idea of where we're going to be going over the next few months. So the first stage of the creativity cycle, I like to call carrying inner disquiet. So to give you the best example of what I mean by that, um, this is usually the stage when a creative is not creating. And yet there is this recognition, either consciously or subconsciously, that there is something off kilter. And a lot of times that sort of feeling of being off kilter, that something is missing, is oftentimes a longer for deeper meaning. And that's what we often find through our creativity. And so this stage of the creative cycle is is unfortunately a stage that many of us can get stuck in for years. We're not creating, but we want to be. We're not creating, but we put other things as a priority. We're not creating, and yet we want to be creating, and yet we're not creating. If we're fortunate, we get to move on to the next stage. That stage, which gets us closer to being able to really dive into creating, I call releasing. It's releasing resistance. It's releasing clutter in our lives. It's releasing distractions. It might even mean releasing people, places, or things, (laughs) the nouns in our lives. Um, it is it is a stage when there is a willingness to do something about the disquiet and about that longing for meaning making. The third stage, then, I call emulating and mirroring. A lot of these sorts of models about um, creativity and the and the artist's journey 
we'll leave this stage out, but I think it's very important because this is a muscle building stage. It is when we have beginner's mind and we're learning and absorbing. Um, sometimes we may emulate those that we um, respect in our field, whatever our artistic endeavor is. And that is great when we are in the learning phase. But after a while, that's going to start feeling a little dissatisfying. Um, so it's important not to get stuck there. It's a step toward trying to, trying to find our true voice. But if we stay in that stage, that true voice will never surface. The fourth stage I call assessing and acknowledging. And this is where the artist's true creative voice starts to show up. Um, the artist then is capable of reviewing what they've learned, recognizing that there's been some growth there. Uh, for a writer, this might be a stage when critique groups or peer feedback um, comes into play. Uh, it's often a really unpopular stage because it causes us to do some inner reflection. Um, sometimes this can feel a little uncomfortable. And so it's an unpopular stage. Um, the getting through and beyond this stage really requires the creative person to have some intense honesty with themselves, to know that there might be places where they need to go back and learn more, or that they're ready to step away and move on to the next stage. Um, so sometimes a lot of fear, uh, fear of judgment, fear of um, imperfection. Uh, sometimes cocooning can happen here and, and get you stuck in that accessing, assessing and acknowledging stage or cause you to move back to the emulating stage. However, when we can take ownership, and that is the next stage, taking ownership of our voice, this is when authenticity shows up. This is when we're able to um, step away from our mentors and our teachers and do some exploration into greater mastery. Um, there is a, a saying of, I'm the one I've been waiting for. And this is the stage when that starts to show up and we really start to get some momentum. That will then move us into the next stage, which I call inviting authentic, uh, authentic existence. And I'm going to pause here. This is the sixth stage. And those first five stages that I just mentioned largely require us to do a lot of inner work. And the sixth through the tenth stage require us to do more outer work. So inviting authentic mm. existence mm. is when we are opening up to this new way of being you know, really claiming that voice as we did in that taking ownership stage, but we're stepping into kind of a new world. It's unfamiliar territory because we might be at the stage when we're starting to, to share more, when we're recognizing that it's good to celebrate what we have done so far. It's, it's a stage of, um, acceptance of consequences of the art that we're doing. And that sounds a little bit ominous, and that's why it can also be an <laughs> uncomfortable stage. But um, we want to be open to inviting our own authenticity to be forefront in our world. Like I said, ladies, feel free to interject whenever you'd like. I hear some I hear some acknowledgement in the background, but I don't hear much from you, so stop anytime you'd like to. Um, so the next stage after inviting authentic existence is verifying and testing. Now in this stage, um, challengers might begin to show up. Um, you will have experienced some of that in the assessing and acknowledging stage, but this is, again, when you might be showing your work out there more. And so there could be some judgment showing up. There could, there could be some, um, some recognition that what you're putting out there may not be accepted by everyone. There will also be some allegiances created in this stage. 
you will be able to verify who your supporters are at this stage. And so you're going to begin to filter out between those who understand what's happening for you and what you're sharing and those who don't understand it. So that's what verifying and testing is all about. The next stage after that is integrate and dedicate. And this is when the creative person really starts to wear that identity of being a creative person, being a writer, being an artist, taking off those masks that we sometimes tend to hide behind. There's no more compartmentalizing of the creative parts of their life from the rest of their life. It's a full integration and a a dedication and a devotion to the creative aspects of their life. Um, That's one I can talk a lot about, but I don't want us to get um, too hung up on each stage. So I'm going to move on to the night stage, which I call three feet from gold. And the reason I call it that is, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of the miner. He hears that there is gold in this one cave. And so he takes his pickaxe and he goes into the mine and he chops and he chops and he chops until he gets blisters on his hands. And then he gets tired and he rests and then he chops and he chops away at the rock some more. And he thinks he sees a vein, but he's not sure. And he needs to take a rest. So he does. And then He gets another wind and he chops and he chops and he chops and he's doing all the hard work that you need to do to get to that vein of gold. But he's really getting exhausted, but he keeps chopping away and he keeps chopping away. And then finally, at some point, he just can't do it any longer and he just gives up. And what he doesn't realize is he was only three feet from gold. That's all he had between him and the gym that he was looking for. Mm. So Mm. this stage, three feet from gold, is when the creative person is probably going to meet more challenges than they ever have. It's a really tough stage, and it's when the author, the creative person, either makes the decision to keep at it or to walk away. Mm. That one hits hard. Yeah, that's a tough one. If the creative decides at that point that they're going to continue, then they go into that 10th stage, which I call your essence expressed. And that is when there's 100% ownership of the creative life. There can be massive productivity at this stage. It is the level that all of us strive to attain. It's when we are most visible. And so that's also the stage when we can really be the most open to hecklers or to judgment. Um, And again, each of these stages, and especially this one, can cause us to loop back through other stages of the cycle to maybe repeat something that we didn't quite learn as well as we needed to. Um, So these these are just the highlights from each one of the 10 stages of the creative cycle that I have seen writers that I have worked with go through. So I'd like to hear from you ladies about what I've talked about here. And particularly, is there a stage that just in general sort of really resonated with you? Or is there a stage that you feel like you're really in right now? And and so it resonates with you because you're experiencing it and why? I love the way that you softballed that at towards us. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to catch? <laughs> A couple of these hit right between the eyes right. with me. Oh, and good. I, you know, first time you showed me this process, Gina, it was like brilliant. It was so many ahas for me um, going through my creative uh cycle myself in finishing my book soul of the seasons and uh you know a lot of us writers love that uh emulating and mirroring 
I call it, it's part of the spring cycle where all the new ideas are popping and there's lots of fun stuff going on. And that's what feels juicy. Uh, and then we get, you know, bogged down into the trenches. And I love that story of the miner because the three feet of gold is one that I personally uh, have been challenged with. And I found a lot of other creative people get challenged at this point and abandon their projects. And uh, during the writing of the book, I, I hit that wall when Gina gave me the final edits. And after, you know, 12. (laughs) I get that as feeling is so relatable. Like Gina's never given me final edits, but I can totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, It was like, well, you know, after about 1156 revisions uh, on my book and, you know, working eight hour days, literally doing some of the final edits in it and then coming back. And then there was this what looked like an enormous long list of changes. And I'm like, mm. <sighs> I temporarily <laughs> did, did not like you right then, Gina. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> that's, that's the true essence of the editor writer relationship. It's like pure love. And also I didn't like you right then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, love you mean it, but go away. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, And she gave me some great advice for it. She said, go in, do the thing and get out Mm. and get it done. Don't go over, don't go over passages. Don't read it as you go along. Just do the thing and get in and get out. And that, when I started doing that, that made it more manageable. I could manage that. That took you that extra three feet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Because that was a hard push. I mean, it was ex- I was exhausted, mm-hmm. really. I mean, we're talking nine years of the writing process and all that it took to get through it. That I was exhausted. I'm like, really? More? Really? <laughs> That's a great example, too, because so many writers feel as if when they can let go of their manuscript and pass it off to an editor, that their job is done. But that's, yes. And they feel yes. like they've hit that vein of gold when, no, they still have three more feet to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I would not have been happy had I let it. I was so tempted, like, it can't be that serious. I would not have been happy with my manuscript had I not pushed and got those last three feet. Mm. And you had the choice to do that. You you could very well I have did. decided that. You know, those revisions that I had tasked you with were um, something you didn't want to do. (laughs) A step too far. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) Uh, It would be interesting. Of course, there's no way to know. But it would be interesting to know that had you done that, which stage of the creative cycle would that have launched you back into? Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's an interesting thought. Uh, where it's the one where you languish and, <laughs> oh, it would have, <laughs> it would have launched me back into that inner disquiet because mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been happy. I would have yeah. just, I, I mean, just like the creative process, it, even when you're doing the final revisions, it's a new spring because you are starting again mm-hmm. with this new perspective of the edits and the revisions you need to do. Oh, I'm glad you said that, too, because that reminds me of something else I wanted to make sure that the listeners understand. So this 10 stages of creativity, you can apply this cycle to your creative life in general. However, it can also apply to a specific project. Mm -hmm. So if you're the kind of person like Kimbu, who can work on 400 (laughs) things at one time, you may be at a different stage of the cycle in different projects. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, but that's the person with 400 projects. Yes, I can confirm. Yes, very, (laughs) very, very very true. So Kimbu, any of these resonate with you? Well, as you were just saying, (laughs) (laughs) uh, I think I probably have a project in every single one of these uh, points on this uh, this cycle right now. Um, 
I was thinking they all they all relate, and I've all, I've been through all of these at some point, but I think right now at this moment in time, the one I'm relating to the most is actually the starting point is the carrying inner disquiet. I have a lot of stories that I've either started or wanted to start and have put aside for many years. And I am starting to feel the pull of working on those stories. And it's, it's the inner disquiet, but, and, uh, I, I don't know how much this really applies to what you're teaching, Gina. There's also fear. There's fear for mm-hmm. me of looking at these stories. Some need to be rewritten. They were written a long time ago and I've gotten much better. Uh, some of them just need to be finished. They're not that bad. Could use edits, but they just need like the, the final third of the story written. Uh, and it's just, there's this well of inner disquiet in me that is mm really calling me to work on these things, even though I've got other things to do. So it's a, it's a difficulty when you're carrying that inner disquiet and, you know, we can romanticize it a lot. You're inner disquiet. And so you need to work on the thing and, and, and just, you know, let it out and put the words on the page. There's, but there's also a lot of fear there. And at least for me, uh, may not be true with other people. They may feel the inner disquiet and run onto the battlefield with, you know, pins flaming or whatever the, uh, you know, metaphor might be there. I don't know. I went pins flaming. I don't know where I came up with that, but I guess that tells you a little bit of swords, maybe (laughs) swords, flaming swords, flaming (laughs) pins. You see how I feel about this. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, that's where I am right now. I do think the three feet of gold was probably second on my list because why do I have a lot of stories that are unfinished Kimbu? Well, <laughs> let me tell you about the story of the miner. And uh, <laughs> so I, I think those two are probably the ones that really sh- struck me in the face at this point uh, where I am on my writing journey. So I would suggest to you, and we'll talk more about this in our next episode when we are going to dive more deeply into that first stage of carrying inner disquiet. There are a number of things that will keep us stuck in that stage. Some of them are internal and some are external. And of course, it's usually only the internal ones that we can do anything about. But recognizing what those things are that are keeping you stuck in inner disquiet is the first step toward moving into that next stage of releasing. And so Mm -hmm. I see you as being in between those two stages, looking (laughs) from the outside in, because I think you're, I think you know what it is. And so it's just figuring out what to do about it. Yeah. I think you're right about that. Yeah. I'm excited to, to talk more about this too, because I do know that the inner disquiet, I've come to learn this at this point in my life, both personally and creative, uh, creatively, is that that inner disquiet is not comfortable. Mm-mm. And my first go-to is, what do I, am I doing something wrong? What do I have to have fixed this so I don't feel this way anymore? But I've learned that that's just a signal that something is ready to get pushed you know, be born Mm -hmm. to get expressed. Mm -hmm. I love that. Now, how about you, Gina? Which, which one of these is uh, a really, I mean, I know we're going to talk about it more in the next episodes, but come on, which, which, which phase are you in on this cycle? You don't think you're getting out of this. So I really think, you know, um, Kimbu and I are sort of on parallel paths right now in exploring a new way of getting our writing into readers' hands. Um, Mm. which is subscriptions. Um, And so we're exploring this new platform that's going to be launching in May called Ream. So I feel like right now I'm at the releasing stage. I have um, put my dreams of my own writing up under a rock for so long. The opportunity to participate in this new approach has reignited the fire underneath me about my writing. And so right now I really am looking at what are the things that are holding me back that I need to release in order for me to move forward and, you know, take this path. Um, So I feel like releasing is, is sort of where I am right now. 
Oh, interesting. Interesting. Right. That's an important part of the of any process is releasing. It's also part of the getting ready to birth something new mm -hmm. because sometimes you cannot bring that new thing in until you have released. And again, don't get too tied to things being linear because those cycles mm -hmm. can come so around true. again and again. And we are one of the worksheets we're going to, the outline we're going to put on the website, there'll be some notations about which seasons these uh, particular steps in the creativity cycle may correspond to. And I invite you to go back, if you haven't listened to those seasons, go back and listen to them on our podcast, uh, all list, listed there, because that will have some important information if you feel you're stuck and what may be causing stuckness in that particular part of the cycle. Yes. Good, perfect. Good point. Yeah, we've got a, a large resource. At this point, we've been doing this over a year, so we've got a pretty substantial backlog of episodes that could really help people. If you want to go back and check them out, they're all linked on our website, so pretty easy to find. Terrific. Well, as we said, we will be talking more in-depth in our ne next episode about the first stage of carrying inner disquiet, so I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Well, thank you all for joining us on this podcast again. We are really excited to be talking about the creativity cycle in our next podcast. Tune in. Like I said, again, we are have all the previous ones listed, and I invite you to go back and, and re-listen to some or brush up on the ones you haven't heard. And please leave your comments or questions there. We'd love to hear from you. So thank you all for tuning in today. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye. See you next time. Thanks for joining us around the writer's table. Please feel free to suggest a topic or a guest by emailing info at aroundtheridertstable.com. Music provided with gracious permission by Langtree. A link to their music is on our homepage at aroundtheridertstable.com. Everyone here around the writer's table wishes you joy in your writing and everyday grace in your living. Take care until next time.